And what those people meant to destroy us, God meant to move us to something else. My wife said to me one day, she said, you know what? I want to be the most encouraging person ever. I want, to, I want to encounter people, and I want those people to leave us never being the same. You ever met a person like that? You just encounter them, and they just radically transform you, and you're no longer the same. I want to be that person. What did, what did, Jesus, what did the people say who hated Jesus' disciples? What did they say about them? These men must have been with Jesus. I want to be that person. Or someone in our work says, you must have been with Jesus. When someone encounters us in life, they say, you must have been with Jesus. And that gets harder and harder and harder in the negative culture we live in. And as I started to think about that statement, I started to realize that, that as Christians, to be encouraging should be like us saying that a basketball player dribbles a ball, a runner runs, a soccer player kicks a ball. If I came up to you and said, you know what, soccer players kick ball, you'd be like, okay. If I came up to you and said, a basketball player dribbles, you'd be like, okay, yeah, of course. A runner runs, as if it's a revelation, you'd be like, of course, there are they're a track runner. It's what they do. But as Christians, encouragement should be just part of who we are. It should be our DNA. You can only, though, encourage from a place of security. That's the truth. You can only encourage from a place of security and assurance in your heart. Actually, there's so many verses about encouragement and that inspire people towards encouragement and godly living. I was having a hard time picking one. And so I rested, I thought, on Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. And, and Paul goes through this whole section in Hebrews, and he basically says, Jesus is better than the angels, he's better than Moses, he's better than the Levitical code. And then he, get, and he breaks in 10, and he says this, and he says, so now, because Jesus is great, because he's writing to Jews, right? He's writing to Jews that are coming under such persecution that they are wanting to flee Christianity and go back to the temple. And, and the writer of Hebrews is saying, no, don't go, because what those things are isn't better than what you have. Stay. And then he tells them something that blows their minds as Jews, and it should blow our minds. See, only one time a year, one person out of one family could enter into the Holy of Holies after he cleansed himself and go before God, and he could make a sacrifice. But he is saying that is no longer necessary because now, because of Christ Jesus, we can come boldly before the throne of grace we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. You know what? I would love to say that I'm like this. I pray after I've exhausted all other things. I'm just going to tell myself right now. I pray after I'm like, I tried this and I tried that and I tried this and I tried that and I tried this. And then I'm like, okay, God, now I need your help. I need you to tell me. And usually what he is, what he tells me is like, you fool, you should have gone and go undo all those things that you did. And now we're going to go down the right path, Right? It's like if you're a builder, I don't, I don't know if you all have zoning codes. I don't think you do because I've looked at a lot of houses, 27 of them. You all don't got zoning codes yet. I saw a toilet on. I was like, what are these people doing with this toilet? They built a box and put the toilet on a box. I'm like, that is really a throne. Y'all take that to the next level. Next level throne, right? Well, we have zoning codes where we come from. And, and, if, a, and if, a, if an inspector comes in and he looks at your job, and he says, this is done wrong. You have to undo everything and redo it, right? And so I'm kind of hard-nosed like that. God does that to me a lot. And he's saying you need to boldly go before the throne of grace, right? And then he tells them this. He says, you know what, guys? Now I want you to encourage one another to walk towards Jesus Christ. And don't give up getting together as church believers. Now, I mean, we have a hard time coming together as church believers if the weather's nasty. He's writing to the Hebrews, these guys were being killed for their faith. Not only were they being killed for their faith, but they were being rejected by their Jewish brothers and sisters for following Christ Jesus. They were sacrificing it all. 
That is not a light statement that we should miss here in our Western culture. He's saying, do not forsake the gathering of the believers. There's something about gathering with believers. Now, I'm not talking about just fake church, right? Fake church annoys me, let's be honest with you. Fake church drives me crazy. Hey, brother, how's it going? Oh, it's great. It's great. I mean, your life is all, hell is breaking loose. You're like, fine, awesome, going really well. And then you get in the car, you're battling with your wife, you're divorced a couple months later, your kids are going crazy because you're crazy. But hey, you're going to church every Sunday, you're telling everybody you're good because we're fake. That's why my generation don't have nothing to do with church. We went and saw all that our whole lives. We're like, nah, forget this. If I want to go, yeah, girl, you like, yeah, right? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. That's how I felt my whole, for a long time in life. Why am I going to go to church? And that's why most of my generation is like, if we want to do what our parents do, we'll stream a podcast. It's much easier. I don't got to deal with people. I just go. I can hear the same word my parents heard because they didn't stick around church and they weren't being honest at church. But Paul's telling these people, look, we want to encourage people. So I gave you a little bit of my sermon because, boy, I studied that for a long time. And that's like a blip. And then my Thompson chain led me to Philippians 2, 1 through 11. I did not realize y'all was, I mean, I did, but I didn't. I was all in that verse. I had it all. I started to plot it out. I lined it up. I was ready to go. I was like, he's like, what are you talking about? I told him. And he's like, oh, we just went over that. And I'm like, for real? What? <laughs> and he's like, no, sir, you go through it. I said, all right, well, y'all going to get it again. One of the main reasons why I felt this verse because for me, visiting this verse is like visiting my journey back again. When I got serious in my walk with the Lord, my youth pastor talked me into going into a missions trip in Chicago. Now, I was one of the youngest managers of Sunglass Hut, which isn't a big deal, but when you're 18 years old and they say, here, you manage this store, that was a big deal to me. And I was having a lot of shrink problems. If you don't know what that is, it's like people were stealing a lot of my stuff. And that stuff comes out of your bonuses. And I wanted my money. Right? My youth pastor was like, I want you to go on this missions trip with us. And I was like, Doug, I can't go. I can't afford it. I can't this. I can't that. He said, well, you pray about it. And my dad and my, my, was working for this company. And I said, okay, Doug, who's going to give me money to go on this missions trip? And he's like, well, just send these letters out and pray about it. We're going to pray right now. Doug would do that to me all the time. It'd get me so mad. So he prayed. I prayed. And he sent out these letters, and my dad gave one to the CEO of his company. And the CEO, she grew up in Spanish Harlem, and she said, you know what, I wish someone would have come and done this in my neighborhood when I was a kid. She wasn't a Christian. And she said, I'm going to pay for both your sons to go on this trip. So now I got the money. (laughs) I don't got an excuse anymore. And I mean, I'm real skeptical on this trip. I'm real skeptical on this trip. Like, like I remember it was downpouring rain and we had to go uh, do street ministry. And I don't want to go witness the people out in the street. You know, I want to walk with some guys like, do you know Jesus? No, I don't. Okay, let me tell you. We're in the middle of Chicago. This is going to be an intense conversation. All right? Especially when you're down in the rich parts of Chicago. You go in the hood. It's actually a lot easier to talk about Jesus in the hood than it is with the rich people. Rich people be like, get out of my face. I got shopping to do. In the hood, they'd be like, mm-hmm, I need Jesus. Yes, I need Jesus. <laughs> right? <laughs> Get around rich people, and they're just like, get out of my face. I just got back from Macy's, you know? And you're just like, okay, you know? And so I'm like, Doug, we can't go. It's downpouring rain. Doug, obviously, this isn't what God has planned for us because I'm, I'm, I'm that guy, right? I'm that guy. I'm going to full throttle push you on to see if you really believe the things you say, right? Because I'm skeptical, but I'm in, but I'm skeptical, but I'm on that fence. And Doug said, let's pray about the rain. I said, Doug, you're praying for the rain to stop. Some farmer's praying for the rain to come. Who does God listen to, Doug? Right? Rayburn's like, amen. All right? Just not now. He's like, no, Lord, stop the rain. Hold it. Send it to me next year. And so Doug said, let's just pray. And so he had this nerdy kid, you know. I don't know. I mean, he got that kid because he was willing to do it. He He didn't dare ask me to pray. He said to the kid, he said, hey, pray for this, Matt, pray for this rain to stop. And Matt prayed. And I'm like, Doug, it's still raining outside. I'm going to get all wet. I just got these new tennis shoes, and you don't want to mess up your new tennis shoes. And so I was like, all right, cool. So we open up the doors, and we step out. And when we step out, the rain stops. I was like, whoa. 
I mean, I'm not joking, y'all. I wish I was, but the rain stopped, the sky parts. We do our street ministry that day. We get back in the van, shut the door, boom, rain starts instantly. And that was like what got my mind to like, okay, maybe this is real. Now, in this, this time, right, it was like some of the final pieces to my puzzle of full surrender to the Lord. In that time, Doug asked us to memorize Philippians 2, 1 through 11. He asked us to memorize Philippians 2, 1 through 11. And now, my favorite translation is Ephesians, is, I mean, is the ESV, because I believe it's more readable, and I believe that not only is it readable, but it also, um, it's more accurate. But since you already have gone over this and we hear things a lot, a lot of times um, we have heard these verses so many times that we tend to like dismiss things. So we're going to use the message, and I know for some people they're like anathema, you know, the message. Just chill out, all right, and just, just re- let, it, let it hit your ears and think about it new. So, got it? Go ahead. Let's read this as a church. Who wants to start? I'll start. Okay. Philippians 2, 1 through 11. Here we go. If you've gotten anything out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in community with the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep spiritual friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourself the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but did not think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantage of that status no matter what. Not all when the time come, came, he set aside the privilege of deity and took on the status of a slave, becoming human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredible, humbling process. He didn't claim special privilege. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death and the worst kind of death at that, crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond any other ever, so that all creation in heaven and in earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow and worship before Christ Jesus and call out, in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. Let's take that for a minute. What an amazing verse. Paul is breaking this down. He's giving us three distinct understandings. He's giving us full disclosure. You know, like when they give you full disclosure when you buy a house and it's like 400 pages long and you just keep signing? Ain't nobody reading that except for a lawyer. A lawyer would be like, can I get that and I'll come back to you tomorrow and sign that? But it's a full disclosure. Paul's giving us a full disclosure. Paul is writing here and he's saying something. He's saying, since... If there's or sense, he's, he's saying that this should just be. This should just be. If you have any encouragement with Christ. Now, I was going to show a video. I'm not going to show it because I don't have time because it took too long at the beginning. DJ gave me 30 minutes, and that's going to be a feat right now. But I just started. <laughs> There's a video and there's a man who has a hundred ounce bar of silver. At the time that this video was shot, and you can go online, I'll put it up on, the, on Facebook, I'll have Chelsea put it on Facebook. At the time, this I believe was worth $1,500. And he has the stack of those big size, you know, uh, Hershey bars, the ones that you get at, uh, at uh, Cracker Barrel, them big ones, right? Them super sized ones. I mean, we're talking about the super sized ones, we're talking about like the jumbo king size ones. They're like this big, right? And so he says, a, he has a 
uh, 100-ounce bar of silver, and he has these king-size candy bars, and he says to the people, which bar do you want? And bunch, I mean, he has like 10 of them there. 10 people come up and they say, I'll take the chocolate, I'll take the chocolate. Some people said, I don't want either, which I don't know what they're smoking. Some of them said, neither. Now, I told DJ when I said this, it's a good thing he didn't do it in the hood. They would have taken both the candy bar and would have taken the silver. He said, you can take them both, all right? So everyone kept rejecting it, and then finally at the end, a guy comes, and he has a pawn shop t-shirt on, and the guy looks at the camera, and he's like, I think this is it, right? This guy's surely going to know this is silver. And the guy so confidently said, well, you know, that looks like uh, it's gold, but it's probably not gold, so I'll take the chocolate. And then the guy flips the bar over. Now, I used to sell jewelry. I sold jewelry for two years before I went into ministry. And jewelry, to start out, has indicators on it that indicate its purity, its weight, all kinds of stuff. And someone that knows what they're looking at knows exactly what those, those marks identify. And when he flipped the bar over, the guy was like, oh, man. That was silver. Now, he knows the price of silver because he's a pawn shop dealer. And he looks at him and he said, "Woo!" the guy said, "Woo!" I thought I was done. And the guy said, man, I'm losing today. Because he knew how much it was. That was $1,500 the guy was going to hand it to him. And being a pawn shop dealer, he could have probably got more than $1,500. See, here's the thing, Christians, that we need to understand, that when you watch that video, you're going to laugh. You're like, silly people. (laughs) Who would take chocolate over silver? We do it all the time with Christ. We do it all the time with Christ because he is offering us pure gold, the word says, and we choose slavery over pure gold. We choose anger and captivity over freedom and love. That's the problem. Because the devil has tricked us that this world is all we have. And so Paul is saying, look, if you've encountered Christ, you're going to have the following things, right? Your life is going to look different, right? Your life will have love in it because you encountered Christ. Your life will have love in it. You won't be the same because you encountered Christ. You will be in communion with the Spirit. You know when the Spirit left Saul, he went crazy? Here's the question. Do I really even know what the Spirit looks like and feels like? Because if I have communion with the Spirit, I'm going to be different. I'm different. Yeah, I'm different, right? I'm not the same anymore. I'm not the same anymore. If you have a heart, if you care about the things of God, you want to know why I want to give up on on ministry at this time? Because I just said to someone the other day, it's not that I'm done with the work of God. I'm going to be doing the work of God my whole life. When I gave over to it, I'm going to ride with this. But I just might not be for the time in the church right now because it's not dead enough to rise from the ashes. That's what I said to my wife. I said, this thing ain't dead enough. It needs to die more before the church is ready to do what God is calling us to actually do. It's not dead enough. You want to know why I was done? Because I kept saying to myself, have these people encountered the spirit of God? We are fighting over the stupidest things. And there are people out here dying. And yet we are stuck with nonsense. We got our feelings hurt, and so because I got my feelings hurt, I'm all in my feelings right now, and now I'm all, oh, I'm not going to talk to that person because they hurt my feelings. Man, what is that? Wait, show me where that's in the Bible, and we'll talk about it, because it ain't. You can search. It ain't in there. Jesus does not give us a right because we got our feelings hurt to hold a grudge forever, and you know what? That's why people aren't coming to our churches. It has nothing to do with, oh, the cultural, it's just going in, and the liberals. And no, it's not it. You want to know what it is? Here's what it is. It's because we do not look like we talk and we judge everybody from a place of bitterness and anger. And the Bible does not give us that freedom. See, I told you all, I mean, DJ said, he said 30 minutes. I was like, all right, brother, I'm going to try. 
So he wants to incite us. That's the next point. He not only wants to give us full disclosure, now he wants to incite us. Have you ever seen, we've seen lots of it. You see a crowd get incited towards violence and they just, they could, they have like superhuman strength all of a sudden. You get a crowd riled up and I don't care how many police and, and, and battalions, you, you'd have to kill them with guns in order to stop them. You get a crowd incited. Paul is inciting Christians. He's saying, I'm appealing to the Jesus inside of you and I'm inciting you to something. He says, then do me a favor. I love how Paul talks. Paul ain't, that's the thing. People are like, oh, you know, the Bible. No, Paul would get into some people's faces. He's getting into their face right now. He's saying, then, right, do me a favor. Agree with each other. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep spiritual friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside. And help others get ahead. Do not be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourself long enough. Just think about that. Let's forget ourselves long enough to do God's work. Why does it always have to be our way? I'm putting myself in that category. James Vernon McGee says the word of God is a two-edged sword. It first cuts the, the preacher, and then it cuts the people. Yeah, I struggled with that. I was in a church for seven years, and the worship was horrible. I wanted to gouge my eyes out. I was like, oh, every Sunday I went to church, I was like, oh, Lord. Oh, this is so painful. Oh, it's so painful. And I, one day God just had to be like, can you, you need to worship me no matter what you're in. Now, the people that like that worship, they're like, amen, amen. You know, you just go with those hymns, right? But let that flip it to the other side. Can we sing some choruses? Can we sing some modern worship? And you don't have to have your own way? Can we do service different than we've always done it before? And can you be okay with it? Because it's about not having your own way. Don't let that just cut the pastor. Don't let that just cut, well, you young people need to hear that. Let it cut your hearts. You know, one of the, one of the, um, I heard, a, I heard this conference singer once, and he said that this, this very prominent church in, in, uh, in uh, um, Phoenix was like, we want to reach the college students. They were right next to the University of Arizona, wherever it was at, right? At Phoenix, I can't remember. There's a very prominent university wherever these, this place was at. And they were like, we are going to reach these college students. And so they just started doing whatever they could. They loved these college students, all this kind of stuff, boom. And the church exploded, exploded. It was put on the list of like top 10 things to do in wherever this was at night. And that church was like number 10, and so they go and they interview these people and they see all these older people in the back and they are just like, their hands raised and whatnot. And the guy at the end of the service says, ma'am, because she was like in her 90s and he's like, do you love this music? And she's like, I hate it. I hate it. But you know what I love? You see all these young people there? You see, I know that girl got saved and I've been working with her and I hate this music, but I love what it does to them. Because it's not about our way. When we have the kind of reality that Christ is asking for us, he's going to give us four, four specific realizations here, right? We're going to agree with one another. That's what this whole book of Philippians is about. You already know that. We're going to agree with each other. We're going to love each other. We're going to have these deep one-on-one -on -one aspects with the Spirit, and we're going to be deep spiritual friends with one another because that's what's tying us together because we have one purpose. Do we have one purpose? Is our one purpose in America as the church, you want to know why I'm done with it? My one purpose as the church in America that I see over and over and over again is like, I just want to go to a church, I want to hear a good message, and I want to go to El Pablito and get my food. <laughs> Amen. One unified spirit. <laughs> that is not what the Bible asks us to be. That is not what the Bible asks us to be. It is not about just coming and hearing our sermon. You know that attitude is what leads the millennials to stream their services. One time I was in one of our church meetings, I said, y'all are so mad about these millennials not coming, but what's the difference? Because there's a very, very, very wealthy, prominent farmer, like the dude worked for the Illinois government. And so you get a wealthy farmer from our area to work with the Illinois government, that's a big deal. All right? Because they don't love Springfield for nothing in Illinois. And so this guy worked his way to the top. He owns tons of land, multi, 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 multi-millionaire. And, and, he, and he's in every meeting that we have, and he's very spiritually mature, and it drives me nuts. I'm like, why is this guy in any of these meetings other than the fact that he has money? And one day they were just railing against these millennials and how they don't go to church anymore and yada, yada. And I said, what's the difference between the millennial and that guy right there? 
That's probably where I started like losing favor with these people. All he does is he comes, he listens to the sermon, he doesn't talk to anyone, and he leaves. He doesn't do anything else with this church. He doesn't doesn't help anyone, doesn't do anything with this church. I've been here for seven years, so I'm not just saying this flippantly. Yet you're okay with that. What's the difference between him and a millennial sitting at home, streaming a service? No difference. Not having to, either one are having interaction. Either one are doing the purpose of the church. We are called to be one body, one mind, to move this thing forward, to heal the brokenhearted, to encounter people. So when people encounter us, they're like, dang, where do you go to church at? And you're like, we go to First Baptist. And they'll be like, well, I'm coming there tomorrow. <laughs> right? I'm coming there tomorrow. Because I don't know what you got, but I want that. When's the last time someone encountered you and was like, I want that? And I'm not talking about food. I'm not talking about a new car. I'm talking about the spirit of the Lord because they, they bumped up against Jesus. Those men must have been with Jesus. Those people at First Baptist must have been with Jesus. And you know what? Stop saying, I just got saved. I don't have anything. The woman at the well encountered Jesus for five minutes, went back to the village and told them, and the whole village got saved. So stop saying, well, I just started going to church. I don't really know anything. That woman didn't know nothing, and she slept with multiple men. And the, the reason why she went to the, to the well at noon was because people made fun of her because she was a cultural pariah. And she went back there and said, oh, they told me everything I ever knew. And they're like, well, that must have been some story, sister. We got to find this man. So they went and heard him, and they came back. And they're like, oh, my gosh, we don't need your testimony anymore, for we've encountered him ourselves. We've encountered him ourselves. So stop using the excuses and let's get to work. I'm just going to tell you what I'm about right now. So I'm just, (laughs) yeah, girl, don't worry. (laughs) I've never been accused of that. (laughs) Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside. Help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. Can you imagine what our churches would look like if we did that? Man, that church always is helping. You know what? It's easier to give people money than it is to spend time with them. Can I just say that? It's easier for me to throw $10 to a homeless man than to spend time with that homeless man. That gets gritty. That gets funky. That gets, that gets funky and funky, right? But have you sat down with somebody who's homeless and asked them sometimes why they're in that position? You ever sat down with somebody who is going through some drug addiction and ever, ever, th- ever asked yourself how they got to that place? That's gritty. That's hard. That's difficult. And that, you know, when you do that, you know what that happens? You can't dismiss people anymore. See, we only want to deal with people that look like us and smell like us and sound like us. And that's why the church is losing people. Because there ain't people out there that look like us anymore. We want to be different. So now Paul goes into a mic drop moment. He just says, okay, here it is. And he says, look, if you want to make an excuse for yourself, I'm going to give you no excuses. Let's look at Jesus, who was deity. I'm not going to reread it, but what does he say? He was deity, and he set aside deity in order to come down and be humanity and to die on a cross. And he, he, he let Pontius Pilate know one thing. Pilate got cocky with him and said, hey, I have the right to take your life or to give your life. And, Pilate, and Jesus said, no, you have no power except for the power that my father gives you. You know the funny thing about history? History, I love it. Funny thing. You know the only reason why we know anything about Pontius Pilate? It's because his Roman historians reference Pontius Pilate because he killed Jesus. That's it. He is an unknown figure in history except for one thing. He took Jesus' life. And in that day, he thought he was the man. I have the power to take your life. And Jesus said, mm-mm. Can you imagine the soldiers in the garden? I, that's one of my favorite parts. Of the, that's the dopest part of the Bible right there. I'm going to say it right there. Dope means like it's really cool, right? It's really nifty. Right? It's the dopest part of the Bible, right? He's in the garden. And they say, where's Jesus? And he says, I am he. 
everyone lays down on the ground. Now, I'm going to tell you, those must have been some very courageous soldiers, because I'll be honest with you. If there have been a couple of brothers in the hood, be like, we out. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. Leave that man alone. Leave him alone. He just knocked us down. He just said, I am he, and we all fell down. Let's go. Get out of here. I ain't losing my life today. Right? That's the truth. He was power. But he was meek. And meekness is not weakness. It's power under control. And you know what we need? More people that are meek in the church, which are people that have power, but put it under the control of the Spirit because they want God's way, not their way, and that's what Jesus wanted. That's what Jesus wanted. And you know what? In the end, when we don't do things God's way, we lose out. I'm tired of arguing like save, not save, this, that, and the other thing. You know what? Here's the reality. If this gospel is true, it's amazing. And if we're living it, it's amazing to live it. It's a privilege to live it. And it gives us things that we couldn't even imagine. And to not live it means that we're losing out on something. And I'm always reminded because I'm from Chicago, so I'm like, I love the Bears. Love the Bears. I love the White Sox. And I love the Bulls. I know I should like hockey, but we didn't grow up playing hockey where I come from, so I don't know. We just didn't, okay? So the 85 Bears were amazing. We still talk about them because we haven't done anything since 85. <laughs> we haven't been anything since 85. All right. In 2005, when my Bears lost to Peyton Manning, I th- I, oh, I was in such mourning. I listened to classical music for two weeks straight. And I was like, just don't talk to me. My wife would come in and say, what are you doing? Leave me alone. I need a moment. How do you have the best defense in the league and the best running, running offense in the league and you pass the ball in a rainstorm? Thank you, God. So we keep talking about the 85 Bears. We don't bring up the 2005 Bears. It's too heartbreaking. There was a player. His name was Todd Bell. He was an all-pro safety in 85 the year before. He wanted a contract dis- dispute, and he said him and Richard Dent and some other players all wanted more money because they're like, we're the number two defense in the league. We want to get paid. We're the only thing good about this team. Now, the rest of them went to work, and the Bears said, we'll work on your deal after the end of this year. But Todd Bell said, no, I want to get paid, and he sat out that season. Todd Bell missed the great... Now, I'll be honest with you. I didn't even know who he was. I just knew there was a Bears player that sat out the 85 season. I didn't even know the guy's name. I know who Mike Singletary is. I know who Richard Dent is. I know who all those, and Walter Payton. I know Frigerator Perry. Frigerator Perry wasn't even that big, wasn't even as good as Todd Bell. But I remember his name. I don't know nothing about Todd Bell. Why? He sat out. He sat out. He missed. Now I'm going to tell you something. Them 85 Bears have made way more than $950,000 off of that 85 season. Trust me. There's not a place in Chicago they have to go where people don't buy their products, give them drinks, or give them a home. That's the, we're serious in Chicago about our football. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, right? This is the thing. Todd Bell missed out. He is forever remembered as the player that didn't play. We are going to get to heaven and sit in eternity, and they're going to be like, you were the player that didn't play. You made it in here, but you barely made it in here. And there's all these people that you could have reached and you chose not to reach because you wanted to sit out because you wanted your way instead of being part of the team. Now, that's the thing, right? I'm going to show you this picture, and I'm going to tell you something. that Why this picture? And I'm going to end with this, I swear. Sorry, DJ. I always got in trouble at the last church I was at because they're like, you preach too long. I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm just doing what God told me to do. So you got that picture? This picture is very beautiful to me for it represents my career. And this picture here is two youth pastors, the guy in the white and the guy that's an idiot right there all the way to the left. His name is Pete and Austin. Austin was my intern. Pete was my intern. And both those guys being in this picture, Pete lost his fiance in a tragic, tragic car accident and went into a drug haze. And I was working with his brother and his brother's best friend. And they were also addicted to drugs and they were very popular kids. They got saved. And they said, started saying like, we need to pray for my brother. He would get saved. Them guys went to the throne room of grace. And one day their brother said, I don't know what you guys have, but I want what you have. And he came to Jesus. Now he went to Trinity Theological Seminary. He's a pastor now. He's a very dynamic pastor. And Austin was a shy, quiet kid that wouldn't talk to nobody. 
Now, both those guys said to me, we're going to Radius this year. I said, well, that's great. None of my kids want to go to Radius this year. And this kid, his name is Aiden. He's right there in the dead center. He's got that weird crooked smile on his face. Aiden was an intense kid. Last year at uh, Labor Day, I was in Houston delivering supplies for Hurricane um, Harvey. And one of our youth workers called and said, what are we going to do with Aiden? He's a pretty intense kid, and he does a lot of crazy stuff. And I knew Aiden's story. He had been through a lot with his parents and a lot of different things that had happened to him. And I said, girl, I don't know what we're going to do with that kid, but we're going to figure it out. He said, okay, as long as you've got a plan. I'm like, I don't really got a plan, but we'll figure it out. Now, who's not pictured in that photo is a young man who just used to roam the streets of Morris, the youth center I worked at, and he came on staff at the church. And so him and me and other people just started working with Aiden over time that year, and just he hung out with Aiden all the time and loved on Aiden, and we just spoke truth into Aiden, and I just let, let those guys do their thing. I don't always have to be the man. It actually gave my heart joy to see other people do God's work. So Aiden gets his life turned around, man. I mean, this dude gets on fire for Jesus. He's all in. He's all for it. And he says to me one day, he says, Nick, I want to go on a missions trip. I said, well, Aiden, you're not ready to go to Guatemala. But I said, Aiden, there's this trip called Radius, and I'd like for you to go. He said, all right, let's go. So we go to Radius, and all hell is breaking loose in our church. Things are going crazy right now, and I'm like, okay, God, I don't know what you're doing, and I sure don't have time to do this missions trip, but I don't want to disappoint Aiden. God has really transformed his life. We're going to Radius. And so it's at Radius as I am sitting there, and I'm hearing DJ. Now, here's the thing. I like DJ. I like his preaching and stuff like that, but I'm so focused on everything that's going on in my life, I really am like, I don't have time to be here. I'm super distracted that week. And so at the end of Radius... Um, DJ just kind of told me like, hey, I, I, I'm, you know, he had made mention of the church he was at and so on and so forth. And they're like, man, I got to talk to this brother. I got to ask him some questions. I just need his advice. I just need insight, right? I'm gathering insight from people that I, that I trust and that I've observed. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to put his advice in the advice column here. And I said, hey, do you want to go with me to drop Aiden off and I'll bring you back? Because I surely thought he was going to be there for a couple more days. And he's like, no, I got to head back to Kansas, but you can call me tomorrow. So I said, okay, I'll call you. Now, I'd overheard DJ say to some people that he was, there, that you guys were looking for a youth pastor, but I really wasn't interested in being a youth pastor. When I tell you I was done, I was done, I was done, I was done. And it's not because I don't love youth ministry, love it. It's not because I don't like working in the church, I love it. But I just was like, there ain't no church, that me and no church is going to, we just don't agree right now. We're going to agree to disagree right now. So I talked to DJ, we talking, and I mean, and he's video talking me, and I think he was, pay I didn't realize this at the time, but when DJ talks to you, he paces, and so he was looking at me like this in the phone, and I was almost getting dizzy, because they just kept seeing the room just <laughs> swirl. I was like, what is this man doing? He just swirling, walking around. I mean, he just like, he's like, my internet keeps breaking up. I'm like, well, if you would sit down, bro, it would probably catch the internet. You keep outrunning the internet, bro. So we just <laughs> walking in circles, and we talked for like an hour or so, and, I, and I, was like, I was like, hey, man, you know what? I hear that you guys are looking for a youth pastor. Maybe I'll send you my, my resume, but I don't even know if I'm really in this anymore. But, but any guy that they let in the church that just walks around like this all day, I was like, ah, I'm interested. It got my attention, all right? I, like, I got to check this dude out. So I said I'll send him my resume, and then I Googled Chanute, Kansas, and I was like, oh, whoa, whoa, man, I thought you were outside of Kansas City, homie, this ain't nowhere near outside of Kansas City, I was thinking like a suburb of Kansas City, brother, you are two hours out of Kansas City, but I'm a word is bond, you know, so I sent him my resume, and DJ didn't call me back, and I was like, well, that's okay, <laughs> okay, I was like, we going to Houston, honey, she's like, yeah, let's go, you know. And things kind of fell apart faster than I thought at the church. I thought we were going to be there for one more year, and I was just going to, like, in a loving, peaceful way, just say, hey, we're going to just agree to disagree, and I'm going to go my way. And so then I leave the church early, and we go down to St. Louis, and I'm going to hang out with Amy's brother. And Amy, we're talking. I wanted Amy to meet DJ, because I'm like, you got to meet the, the dancing pastor here, bro. 
I just wanted to meet this guy, and we just wanted to talk. We mainly went down there to hang out with Amy's brother and stuff. When I hit the room, DJ comes in. He's like, oh, my gosh, you're here. And I'm like, yeah, I'm here, homie. And he was like, no, you don't understand. He's like, this is crazy. Now I'm here. And I'm going to tell you, man, when DJ and me were talking about, about what would it look like to be a pastor and that there was a bunch of people that needed, 16 people are being interviewed and all that kind of stuff, I was literally like, my wife was like, no, no, no. We got in a fight. We got in a fight so bad in the car. We were sitting in Panera Bread, and our children were, were sitting there looking at me, looking at my wife, looking at me, looking at my wife, looking at me, looking at my wife. And I was just like, I was, she was like, no. And I was like, I feel the spirit leading us, honey. And she's like, no. And so my wife has been training to be a Pilates teacher, She's almost done. She had to go to Pilates class. And she worked out so hard, she was like broken. She like came out limping. <laughs> like, man, you must have really worked out hard. So we're laying in bed that night, and she starts crying. And she said, I'm angry because I feel God leading us here, and I don't want this to be true. It has nothing to do with the location. Can I tell you? It has nothing to do with the location. It has to do with the fear of churches saying what they want and not doing what they want. It's the fear of, like, I am far away from my family, I am far away from my people. But I said to the Lord, I will go wherever you take me, I will do whatever you call me to do even if it's in Chinook, Kansas. Even if it's here. I don't know what God has for me here. I was wondering that when I was looking at houses. I was like, woo, Lord. Houses in this place. But I'll go here, Lord, and I'll be here, Lord. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you for today. Forgive me for taking so much time, but Lord, I just pray that you would just guide us. Help me to seek your face. I just thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, Nick. God bless you. <laughs> amen. God bless you. Um, Nick, I told him to take his liberties. I told him I only go about 10, 15 minutes every Sunday. So <laughs> if you go a little long, they're not going to be used to that. So <laughs> uh, God is good. We're going to say a prayer, and, uh, and we're going to let... Our, our guests uh, head home. Sometimes when you come to our church, it will feel like a hostage crisis. It will. Um, but we're going to let our visitors go, and then I'm going to ask uh, the members to stay as we transition into service. Now, let me say this. Maybe you're a person who feels like you're on the outside. You're on the margins. Um, I was told last Sunday, and you, the dude might be here. I want to talk to him. He's here. I was told last Sunday somebody got on the stage and smoked a cigarette during the music time. I didn't see that part of the service. I, was, I don't know where I was at in my emotions, but I wasn't there for that. You may feel like you're on the outside. You may feel like you're on the margins. And, um, you know, we, we want to honor God, right? We want to we represent God every Sunday. We want to do what's right in God's eyes. We also want to make sure that we love people where they are. There are people who attend church who want that to be pretty, who want that to be clean, and want it to be a certain way. Every And before I got saved, I thought that's what it was. It's A, B, C, D, E, F, but it don't go. Sometimes it's A, R, K, M, N, O, J. Uh, it just doesn't always be pretty and clean. And so if you're a person who's on the outside and you feel like there's no way possible that Jesus Christ would love me, I want to encourage you this morning before you get out of here now as we say this afternoon. I want to encourage you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, you're not going to perish. He's got everlasting life for you. And I know that's hard to believe. And if you're a person with a past like myself, uh, you have to fight back. I've, I've, I've been saved for a while now, but I still have my weeks and my moments where I'm like, does he really forgive me? Does he really forgive me? And he does. He does forgive you. If you want to talk about that this morning, I'm going to say a prayer. I'm going to be off to the side here. If you want to talk about forgiveness, if you want to 
give your life to Christ this morning, you're in a great place to do that. We're going, we're, we're going to walk with you in that moment, all right? And I got a lot of people who I can dispatch into your life and would love to get messy with you, all right? If you're going through difficulty right now, and you heard Nick in and out, but your mind is overwhelmed by everything that's not right in your life, you're in a great spot to be prayed for. We have lots of people. We, we've got a business meeting, but we, we want to pray with you. We want to we uh, encourage you this morning. All right? Kingdom over everything. Amen? Kingdom over everything. We want to do that this morning. Uh, and so I'm going to pray. I'll be off to the side here if there's some prayer requests, and then we're going to transition into our business meeting. God bless you for coming out this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, everybody that's on the side of my voice, every family that's rest, represented here, every college student that's here, every teenager and young child, Lord. One, I'm so grateful for our kids and how well they behaved during this morning's service, Lord. They thought we were crazy for letting them in, but Holy Spirit, they did well this morning. Thank you for that. We thank you for all that you've done in this church, Lord. We are pressing into you. We want to know you more. We want to be one of those churches that love God and love others. Give us the wisdom for our business meeting. Give us the knowledge and understanding. Help us to be unified. Help us to be family. So grateful to be doing your kingdom business. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.